Nobody wants to confront their peers or their friends or their coworkers because it doesn't feel safe or they don't know what to say. And it just is rampant, but it's in the underbelly. They needed to exercise me with my gay demons. Why should like a six year old at that point in time want to kill herself? Yeah. Like it, it's not right. I know, just realized that maybe I just should stay straight and that it would just be easier that way. But I do know youth that live here and they experience a lot of bullying um, for their sexuality and for their gender. And it's really heartbreaking. Start by just stating your what you identify as and when you came out. Oh, uh, okay. My name is Brenda, and I came out as bi in the early '90s. And back then, it was not okay. Um, and so I kind of kept it private because I'd been told that I would go to hell, and that scared me really bad because of our religious background in my family. And so I did date girls um, all the way up through high school, but I kept it to myself. Um, I identify, I'm cis female. Um, I identify as a lesbian. I've always been gay. <laughs> and uh, I came out to my family when I was about 14. I identify as pansexual, or most people, a lot of people aren't familiar with that term, so I also will use the term bisexual, which more people are familiar with. Um, I originally came out when I was 20 years old, and I'm 45 now. Um, but you don't just come out once, you come out multiple times, because, um, and probably even more so if you're bisexual or pansexual, and sometimes in what appears to be a heterosexual relationship, because people assume you're heterosexual. I identify as a lesbian, pronouns uh, she, her, and I came out, I want to say probably about 14, 15 years ago. Yeah, so I identify as queer and transgender. I came out as queer after my first year in college, so back in about 2004, and I came out as trans in, uh, gosh, about five years ago, so 2013. I'm Levi, I'm 15. Um, I identify as transgendered, and I came out a long time ago, but my mom didn't understand it at the time. I am trans and non-binary, and my sexuality is pan-romantic, demisexual, I guess I would say, at this point in time. <laughs> and my pronouns are they, them, exclusively. Like, there are some social situations where I will go to he, him, but pretty much adamantly they, them. My name is Katarina Haas. I identify as a transgendered woman. I came out as, well I've always knew I was bisexual since I was about six years old and um, I never really had a coming out for that as people kind of, you know, eventually found out, you know, through the years. Uh, I've been trans, started my transition about three years ago. Um, before that I was exploring and trying to see what, you know, Try and figure out who I was. So. My name is Lauren. I am 18 years old and I identify as bisexual. I, I identify as a lesbian. Um, my pronouns are she, her as well. Um, I mean, I never really came out. It was like one of those things that was uh, kind of pushed because I was a world class logging competitor. So uh, I lived in La Pine, which is a really small town and people assumed that I was gay and I wore flannels because that's what I wore in my competitions so 
I mean, I didn't really have the chance to actually identify myself before everybody uh, kind of put the label on me. Terrifying. It was. It was terrifying. So I have a twin brother. So I kind of said earlier, I have a twin brother. And he kind of knew I was a little different. And um, after I came out to my parents, to my mother and my stepfather, who was in the Marines. <laughs> He's a six foot four Marine guy, about 400 pounds. A mustache to put anyone to shame. <laughs> and uh, I told them I was gay and they didn't really like it. And my twin brother... Um, he struggled a lot because I was gay and I was openly gay. Um, he got assaulted a lot because he's cis male straight and he was called queer and fag and he was also uh, bullied, assaulted because of my sexuality. So kind of layered this guilt on top of it already. <laughs> um, it was it was an experience. Um, they were both, you know, d different um, and had their challenges, um, but I think things have come a long way since then. So when I first came out as queer, my family had kind of a hard time understanding, right? Like I think a lot of families may. Um, their you know, kind of our shared religious background didn't look um, so favorably upon being a member of the LGBTQ community. So it was it was a challenging time, but my parents, I, I definitely still knew that they loved me. Um, and all of that good stuff, but we had a hard time talking about it and we definitely didn't see eye to eye. Mm -hmm. And so I think for a long time after that, I was probably you know less chatty, less open about those kinds of things with them for a while, but um, they've come a long way. We um, actually got married to my husband on their property, not far down the road from here. So, um, and they've really embraced him as you know, a loved member of our family. So certainly we've come a long way since. Never really had to or did, it was kind of an organic thing, but this here was a little different. So I had, I had a uh, handful of people that I wanted to tell in person. Um, there was three people that was, I didn't really care what people thought. I was with three of them, my dad, my best friend, and my daughter. Um, my daughter took it the best. And of course, my dad and my best friend was a little bit, you know, what the but So I did, I took them um, in person. And some people I told, you know, by phone call or, of course, and then I finally made you know general announcement on Facebook. Overall, it was very good. I had uh, nobody that was really negative towards me. They're all accepting. How was it? Well, it was amazing and difficult, and yeah, I'd say yeah, amazing. It was. A very enlightening experience because I had to actually confront my own internalized homophobia, which I wasn't even familiar with that term at that time. I just can't quite remember, you know, that conversation. Yeah. But I know, I do remember their religious background. And so at that time, when I first started realizing, you know, my sexuality was, you know, I was like, I already had known from different conversations that I had heard and about being around other people that it wasn't safe for me to tell anybody. Um, so I honestly think that like coming out as an adult was a lot easier than coming out as a teenager, for sure. Um, like when I came out when I was 14, my mom was not pleased. Like she kind of thought that I just like wanted to sleep with everybody she didn't let me have friends over anymore like it was just to the extreme she even kind of thought that like someone made me that way or something like i was hanging out with the wrong people or something like that and it was just kind of ridiculous and then she kind of just got over it over time like it wasn't a discussion it was just kind of like okay, whatever, now, all of a sudden. And my dad, he was never really weird about it. He was just like, okay, like, that's cool. Um, but then uh, coming out as trans, I was a lot more scared to do it, but it was a lot, like, I mean, the response was a lot better, especially, like, from my mom. I confided in a friend I had who was a lesbian and I told her that I was bisexual 
and I was starting to get really excited about like something could happen there and then so I was talking to my parents about her a lot and getting really excited and then they started to feel like something was going on something wasn't being said and so um, they finally were like what's going on and like who is she and what is what is this and so after a while I told them that I was bi and they basically reacted saying that no you're not and they said that um, I was too young to identify with a sexuality or I was just bi curious and I didn't know anything because I hadn't actually been in a relationship with a woman yet or been intimate so I didn't really know and so um, they ended up leaving the house for a while saying that they needed to like think about it and not see me so I stayed home and I kind of just realized that maybe I just should stay straight and that it would just be easier that way. I think mine was a little bit better than some people's. I just, m most people knew before I did because when I was in high school, a lot of rumors were going around when I was just a freshman that I was a lesbian. But back then I kind of was like, oh, well, I really don't like boys. I don't know what's going on. And I actually got assaulted my freshman year because of that. But so I just kind of like kept to the like just bags and just kind of did my own thing. And then when I was like about 17, 18, I came out as bisexual because it just seemed like it would be like the easier thing to do to deal with it. But then when I like was 19, 20, I got with my first girlfriend. I'm like, okay, I'm gay. And my friends were pretty much like, we knew. And my parents actually took it a lot better than I thought it was gonna be. And they thought it was a phase, but I'm like, eh, it's like 13 years later and it's not a phase, so. No, no, not even a little bit. Um, I, I got the shit beat out of me a lot. Um, I had rocks thrown at me and um, death threats put in my locker, so I didn't have a locker anymore. And I kind of became more defensive and more aggressive towards others in my behavior just to kind of protect myself. Um, it wasn't so much the people around, it was, it was the culture that the schools fostered, whether they knew that's what it was or not. And I'm not, I'm not blaming the school system or the teachers necessarily because they're handed a suitcase of things they don't know how to handle either. <laughs> um, but no, not really. Uh, so the sense I had, you know, as I mentioned, when I, we first moved to town, we weren't sure what to think, if it was going to be safe or, or to what degree. And I think that while my initial perception has changed in some ways, uh, particularly in the sense of realizing there are a lot of people in this community that do care, that do um, want to be allies to LGBTQ people, who do value and appreciate the diversity, right? There are more of those people, I think, than I realized when we moved out here. Mm -hmm. um, but on the whole, it still doesn't really feel like a completely safe place to live, right? Mm -hmm. um, my husband and I rarely hold hands in public, um, occasionally at the airport, you know, things like that, right? Might give each other a hug in public, but it doesn't necessarily feel safe. Um, and that's unfortunate. I, I know I've been lucky compared to a lot of other people. I haven't had a lot of uh, personal negative experiences, but I have had people, uh, you know, drive down the street and call me a fucking faggot or whatever, right? And so. I, there is the sense, right, of it's not always safe, um, particularly I think as you get outside of Bend, but even, even within Bend, right, uh, but living out here in a more rural area, uh, you see, you know, vehicles with certain kinds of bumper stickers that, that give a certain sense of how people might per perceive you, right, and, um, and I think that's just, that's the reality of being a member of any marginalized community, including the LGBTQ community, there's some element of of always having to be on guard and aware of your surroundings uh, in order to stay safe. And so, even though on the one hand, this isn't a place where I hear about you know, gay bashings and, and these kinds of things all the time, like I might have when I lived in Portland, uh, there's a lot of, I think, kind of more subtle discrimination happening, and not, not so subtle sometimes too, uh, 
that people just aren't really aware of. I think the community here, um, maybe because of who is attracted to this area, the nature of the space, um, is not always really uh, close-knit, I don't think. And so, yeah, I don't know that people know that they even have the support that's there sometimes. So when I came out again, which was the first time I, I really came out publicly in Central Oregon, I would say no. I would say no, not so much. Um, kind of. I think that women have some privilege. Um, I think it's more acceptable for women to be non-heterosexual and in fact is even fetishized by a lot of straight men, um, much to my dismay and chagrin. Um, but it's, it's, so we have some privilege that men who don't identify as strictly heterosexual don't have. So I think I felt safer than I would have as a male. Um, I think males who are not heterosexual are much more at risk of violence than women. Although we do see lesbians victimized too um, in rural areas, you know. Um, but I think generally that we women have some privilege over over males um, and just like cisgender people have privilege over transgender people. My transgender clients, it's a reality for them that they have to be fearful for not only their emotional safety but their physical safety. Um, you know, and it's very important for them to pass as their, um, as their gender because it's important to their physical safety and indeed their very lives to be able to pass. You have these um, alt-right people, you know, congregating in a Walmart parking lot with their Trump flags and their white supremacist flags and their American flags and you know, it makes you feel very unsafe when you know that you're part of one of those communities that they don't want you to be, they don't want you to exist. And to see that on the 4th of July, you're like, oh my God, see, it does exist here. Those people live here. You know, they're not coming here from somewhere else. They live here. all the time yeah um a lot of the stories get buried and a lot of times it's you know people people that aren't out and things like that um i actually kind of stepped up my presence in the community based on a lot of that so yes <laughs> and i don't think that people stand up to it and there's no accountability for it yeah, I definitely hear about people having experiences with homophobia and transphobia. Um, like I mentioned, for myself, I, I've had less of those um, for whatever reason. Uh, we could talk about what those could be, I suppose. But, um, you know, I, I've been called slurs in public. I've had plenty of other friends who get called slurs in public or, you know, kind of aggressively misgendered. I have a friend who is a trans woman and has to go into people's homes as part of her job. And so that's, I can only imagine, a, a scary thing for her not knowing how people are going to react to her or perceive her. I've talked to people living out in Lapine and other kind of more rural areas, um, talking about the homophobia they've experienced, including things like uh, being threatened with physical violence by, by people who they can't escape, right? Because I think in one case it was someone who worked where this person lived, right? Um, we've heard about you know, uh, staff at local businesses getting fired after being harassed in a pretty, a pretty nasty way by uh, customers. So I think we definitely hear about these things happening, but, um, but I think it just hasn't risen to that level uh, yet of uh, the media is going to cover that or it's going to be on everybody's radar. Uh, it's a lot more subtle and I think sometimes I've often wondered if the reason we don't see more of that really blatant pushback is because there's not as much visibility here for the LGBTQ community. I think people have a tendency to react more strongly to something that they, they perceive as being kind of right there in front of them. Um, and I don't think that we're right, we're really at that place yet here. Probably since the election, probably about 30 times that I've experienced negative stuff here in Oregon. Every day. Uh, homophobia is, when I was younger, it was super prevalent. prevalent. Um, I, I rented that duplex with my sister and I had a rainbow sticker on the back of my Jeep 
and you know that's what I would drive to work in and that. And magically, when I put that rainbow sticker on, my tires would deflate and get them fixed. Get a little Schwab, something would happen. Um, a week later, my tires deflated again. So I think it was about the fourth time I took the rainbow sticker off. My tires started just staying inflated. It was just the most miraculous thing. Like I do get a lot of hate stares, but I'm like, I'm also black. So it could be both, like it could be one or the other, but I don't actually really know which one it is. So um, I haven't really experienced like any blatant transphobia. Except for like, you know, individual interactions with people here and there. Yeah, here I have it, my kids have at the skate rink. They've experienced homophobia and transphobia at the skate rink. Which is heartbreaking. Yeah. You know. Kids shouldn't treat kids like that. People shouldn't treat people like that. And we're raising our kids. So they're learning how to treat people from the people they're around. We're protesting um, grocery outlet the other day um, because this Latina woman in town was a checker there and she's lesbian. Hair was short, you know, so this customer came in and just started screaming at her. I don't want any diet helping me. And refused to be checked out. And instead of just escorting her from the store, the manager came and took over the transaction and apologized to the customer that was causing an issue. And then how they handled that harassment, they, you know, needed to go home and needed to, you know, decompress because that's traumatic. That's very traumatic to experience that. And then to not be supported makes it even harder. So she left work because she was too shaken up, didn't really click, you know, she kind of thought she had that approval. And um, the next day, she came in and she was fired from her job. Because when you're in a world where you feel like you don't belong, you feel like you're not wanted, you feel like you're hated just because of your identity. It's very lonely, and it's not a world that many want to live in. There's a, a woman I know, and her child, and I don't know if they had a label, but I think they were kind of genderqueer. Her older son is, is trans, um, F to M, and her younger child ended up stealing a gun and shooting themselves last fall. Um, and that person had a very supportive parent, so your suicide rate decreases when you have a supportive parent. But I think just the vile and viciousness of people kind of outdo outperforms the support that those who love them can give. Yeah. I try to do some LGBTQ kid outreach and connect them with big brothers, big sisters. Um, suicide prevention with youth kids is incredibly important to me. Um, having been gay and growing up here, I can get it. Um, it's scary. Like, I think six, six queer kids commit suicide a year in Central Oregon. Um, and it's pretty, pretty heartbreaking. They are, and that's not something anyone's going to talk about, but these are just people I happen to know in the spheres. So I had a friend through my um, fellowship, my, my church, who was a victim of internalized transphobia. She committed suicide. She was a transgender woman, and her, her parents um, from Pineville never accepted her gender and never accepted her, and, um, and she suicided. It's gone on than just more of these past couple of years, because I was in high school 10 plus years ago, yeah. and I had a friend who was bullied, uh, and I think pretty positive it was because he was gay and he hadn't come out yet. And it got to the point to where it got so bad that he shot himself in the chest. And it's like, kids shouldn't have to go through that. And then there's been teens who openly killed themselves in front of people at a poetry reading because they were harassed so bad. And so I think it's really linked together because even people can be uh, how do you want to put it? Bullied and sexist and racist 
to people of the same color. So it's it's ridiculous. Yeah, you, you can't fit in that box and you try so hard to put yourself in this little box of acceptance, you know, but no matter what you do, you don't fit in this box. You know, there's no way for you to fit in this box. You're never gonna fit in this box. You know, so eventually you find yourself thinking that the only way to be happy is to just not exist. And so it brings, it makes you feel, you know, isolated. And I felt that way for so many years, even though I had my family, I still felt something was missing. And I always tried to find friends, but it's really hard to find that connection. Like, it's hard to put into words, but once you find that, and you find that community that gets you on this very deep level, it's like nothing else. You know, it's just an amazing experience. So we are the Human Dignity Coalition and it was created in 1992 as a response to some like anti-gay ballot measures and some folks came together and realized that Ben didn't really have an LGBTQ advocacy group and that's what they wanted to do. So they formed in order to fight some legislation that wouldn't have been good for the queer community and have just existed ever since then because the need has just never gone away for us to be here. There's only so much that we can do as a five-person all-volunteer board in order to make everything change the way that it needs to. I think we need to come, we need to be out more and include the community and say, look, this is us. We're not scary. We're not dangerous. You know, we're not contagious. We're just people, yeah. you know, that love people. And we just want everybody to love each other, you know. So I think that there needs to be more acceptance, more advocacy, more education. Um, in the schools, they need to include queer sex ed. Yes. That's a, there's a huge outcry for that. Um, another thing that I've heard about is dances, creating da dress codes based on gender. I don't agree with that. I think that anybody wants, that wants to wear a dress should be able to. Anybody that wants to wear a suit should be able to. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be this line, you know, it should be more inclusive. The other thing is gender inclusive restrooms. I do know that there are a few schools that do have um, gender inclusive restrooms, but they need to have more. All the schools should have them all of them and I'm not saying not have male female bathrooms period but they need to have also have a gender inclusive restroom mm -hmm. so there's a lot of work that needs to be done I would like to see um, more uh, I'd love to see a, a, a bar or a nightclub someplace that's not just once a month type of thing but you know, someplace we can go um, or people who come visit to go because this is a tourist town and I get a lot of people online saying, where do, where do I go, you know, is there anything happening? So I love to see a, you know, a bar or some, some place that's more friendly towards us. Having that space for people shows the community that there's a need for it. And so if you have somewhere like that that's a gathering place, then it makes kids go, oh wow, there's a place for me. There's other people like me. If this business is sustaining itself, then the community must be big enough. And then that leads to being visible in having a pride parade where people from all over town and all over the surrounding areas want to get involved. And it's a huge show of support. And we just don't have those things. And we're trying to create them, but it's slow goings in this community because nobody wants to admit that there is more that could be done and everybody feels like it's a personal attack on what they're doing as a business or as a person and we're just trying to spin that around and say you know what you're doing is great but there needs to be more of it it needs to be bigger it needs to be more visible there needs to be education there needs to be affirming messaging from all of these businesses from city council from schools and that just isn't happening in the way that there's not enough of a community of diversity to like, you know, be like, hey, 
that actually looks like something that would be interesting and inclusive and I want to go. Our community needs to try a lot harder. Despite whatever issues that nonprofits have in trying to organize and do things because it's volunteer based and organizers get in the way and egos get in the way, it's the will that matters, right? It's the want to make the world a better place. So I think and I believe in my heart, Bend will be a more accepting place. I have no doubt about it. But we as citizens have to be accountable for that acceptance. Um, so I would say it's definitely got more liberal and more progressive. But I would say that we've got to be careful to not idealize it and not romanticize it. I think there's still a long ways to go. We have not arrived. We, we are not in a a post um, hom homophobia time. We're not in a post transphobia time. We're not in a post racism time. We're not in a post sexism time. You know, I believe all these isms are, are definitely, we've made progress. Yeah, we've come a long way, baby, but you know, we still have miles to go. I really like, like straight people to know that it is hard and like, it's not just like us complaining it's like, this is a serious thing, like, I think about this, like, if I had come out, like, on my own, and or if my parents had acted, reacted differently, mm -hmm. like, how I would feel, like, if I'd be more comfortable as a person. There are many more LGBTQ people here than people probably realize, even people within the community, right? We don't always realize how many people are out there, and so uh, I think just keeping that in mind. Um, again, whether you're part of the community or not, there's, there's a lot of us out here. Um, we're just not always super visible, so. We're in this together. I mean, hands down, we're in this together. So, it could not be for you. That's fine, but I promise you we can all have dinner together.